greeting everybody. God bless you all. God bless we you, begin Father. this um, Phase VS session, studying the Bible, uh, looking with the face, going after the face of God, Jesus, through uh, the studying of uh, the study of Scripture, sacred Scripture. So we greet you with all the blessings. And we begin always, as always, with a prayer. So I would like to invite you to get to this website called papamio.org. I hope you see it clearly. And you go to that, that spot here. You see my index finger? Press it and it will appear for you. That prayer. It's called Papa Prayer. Prayer for priests. And let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, please listen and pray along in your heart. Almighty eternal God, look upon the face of Christ, and of the love of him who is the eternal high priest. Have mercy on your priests. Remember, O most compassionate God, that they are but weak and frail human beings. Stir up in them the grace of their vocation which is bestowed on them by the imposition of the bishop's hands. Keep them close to you, lest the enemy prevail against them, so that they may never do anything in the slightest degree unworthy of their sublime vocation. O oh, Jesus, I pray for your faithful and fervent priests, for your unfaithful and tepid priests, for your priests laboring at home or abroad in distant mission fields, for your tempted priest, for your lonely priest, for your young priest, for your aged priest, for your sick priest, for your dying priest, for the souls of your priest in purgatory. But above all, I recommend to you the priest dearest, dearest to me, the priest who baptized me, the priest who absolved me from my sins, the priest at whose mass I assisted and who gave me your body and blood in Holy Communion. The priest who taught and instructed me or helped me and encouraged me or the priest to whom I am indebted in any other way, particularly. Let us pray for our Holy Father, Pope Francis, for all the bishops are meeting who are meeting in Baltimore right now. And also we want to pray for our own Papa Bishop, um, Bishop Joseph Strickland. O oh, Jesus, keep them close to your sacred heart and bless them abundantly in time and eternity. Amen. O yeah. oh, Mary, Queen of the Apostles. Make your Make priests holy. O oh, Mary, Queen of the Apostles. Make your priests holy. Priest holy. O oh, Mary, Queen of the Apostles. Make your priests holy. St. John Vianney. Pray for Pray us. St. Alphonsus. Pray for Pray. us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay. Once again, blessings to all of you. This is called Phase EBS. And our aim, our goal, our purpose is to study the Word of God. We are pursuing the face of God and we want to, want to see the face of God okay, in person. And this mm -hmm. is our pursuit for life and for eternal life. So we begin uh, with the um, methodology. Number one, we are studying the Bible, so uh, we have to narrow down which um, part of a passage of the Bible we're studying. We're going to be studying the, the readings from the previous Sunday. We divide the readings, the liturgical reading from the past Sunday, which is the 30, 32nd, isn't it? Yes. So the ordinary time cycle A, and uh, that part we have, uh, we're going to divide it into three sections, three phases. Uh, this is not the face, but the face. F, uh, not F A C E, but P H A C E, right? So, oh, three faces. Okay, some people, uh, as uh, you know, as yours truly, we, when uh, English is not our you know, first language. So we have to spell it out for, just to be sure that we're not talking about the face, 
but we're talking about the face. <laughs> there are two kinds of faces in, in English, okay? Exactly. So three faces. The first phase, we're going to summarize, do a kind of a summary of um, all the readings, and then I will, I will uh, proclaim the gospel okay, from the past Sunday, which is the 32nd Sunday of Ordinary Time, cycle eight. And then we'll share the homilies. You have gathered, recorded, reported, okay? And get to the point and how is it relevant to us and then we'll study the um, we'll study the gospel, okay. And so in reporting, and this is my my our method for Papa people is critical thinking. So we get to the point. What is the point? What is it? And then so what? What does it have anything to do with us? And now what? Threefold what question? It's simple, okay. Life is uh, is complicated already, so we we make it more simple for everybody to enjoy. And get something or take something home. So let's get right on. How do we say that? On to it. Get on it. Yeah. Okay. First I phase. Am. So the first, uh, we're going to go to the 32nd Sunday Order Time Cycle A. So there will be four readings. We include the responsorial psalm. Okay. So that means four. The first reading is about the book of wisdom and chapter six, verse 12 to 16, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, only five verses. And it is very telling. Okay. So the whole point is about the yearning for wisdom, which is the source of not just of life, but um, of happiness and of uh, eternal life. So, if you have you yearn for wisdom, okay, uh, you go you are going to seek wisdom. And the world today, our world today, has a lot of information. Maybe true knowledge, a lot of fake knowledge, a pseudo knowledge. Okay, knowledge is science. Science means knowledge. Science means knowledge. But among those who do have true knowledge, which is science, many do not have wisdom. Okay, a person could hold a PhD and work on the in the, the Silicon Valley, uh, work in the AI, you know, technology. Okay, famous uh, YouTube personality holding high degree okay knowledgeable okay famous it doesn't mean that person naturally has wisdom okay this is a reason um, <coughs> the reason that uh, mr uh, carlo cipola in 1978 he wrote a book on uh, the principle of stupidity so <laughs> even yeah so even, you know, he said even uh, kings and queens and popes and presidents and prime ministers and uh, professors and uh, universities, you know, according, scientifically speaking, and this is proven, there are many who are stupid. So stupidity yep. is, not, is, not, uh, is not the antithesis of, um, of uh, knowledge. Stupidity, in this sense, is the antithesis of uh, wisdom. Okay, we're not talking about intelligence, IQ or EQ. Okay, IQ is uh, intelligence quotients, and EQ is emotional caution quotients. But I do not think the EQ is really science, because you can never, could never really uh, quantify emotion. You could only quantify, uh, quantify intelligent a little bit, but uh, emotion, it's it's just fleeting. Just like um, you uh, you do not know how to do that, so we we just invented something called EQ, emotional intelligence. What is that? So uh, we have to think about it. So 
it boils down to whether we we yearn for wisdom, we love wisdom, we go and seek after wisdom. But the moment you understand that uh, you yearn for wisdom, wisdom is already there. The very fact that we are yearning for wisdom. Isn't is that wisdom. amazing? Oh my gosh. But then uh, when you yearn for wisdom and um, you realize that you don't know what you're, you're yearning for, but you still yearn for it. <laughs> That's wisdom as well. Because we don't know what wisdom is. And then, so uh, this is a, a repetition. We know what knowledge is or information is. We can accumulate it. We could pile it up. And most of the knowledge or the, um, the information we have, the majority, like the majority of all our knowledge is not used. They are not useless, but it's, they're not necessary for us to live day-to-day -day, uh, you know, life, right? So uh, we, we know this, just uh, returning to everything that you have learned in high school and in college and uh, graduate schools and whatever degrees you have, how much did you use? How much do you re did you retain? Yeah. Uh, or you, you are retaining right now. So all the knowledge, they're not, all of them are not, uh, no, they are necessary in some aspect, but we don't use it. Okay, so we go to the point of wisdom. This is a repetition again. Wisdom is this. Well, we have many good things, many bad things. You avoid the bad, and you choose the good. And then among the good, you filter them because you choose the good that is good for you. That's wisdom. As you get rid of the good that is not good for you. Yeah. Medicines are good, but not all medicines are good for you. We spoke about this already. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Food are good, but not all food are good for you. Yeah. So knowing how to, you know, to get rid of those unnecessary things for you. Uh, rest is good, but resting all the time is not good for you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So the saying in in the there's a, a proverb in the, in Africa I don't know maybe it's in Kenya uh, saying um, that as the sun rises all animals all animals run whether you're a lion or gazelle you run the first thing you do in the morning you run the lion run after the lions runs after its the food and the gazelle run away from being come becoming a, the food for the lion yeah <laughs> so that that's how you keep yourself healthy they all know they have wisdom you know they have wisdom. they know what you're in they're running after and they know what you're, they're running uh away from uh, and why they do know if you don't run in the morning you get fat right so and you get eaten. People fatten you up to uh, slaughter you and to eat you. And that happens in our spiritual life as well. We got fat up with all kind of knowledge unnecessary. Some of the majority of uh, those things we know are fake or untrue. And so we think critically. And critical thinking is to really a way to sort it out. Okay, so let's move to the next one. Response or psalm, once again, my soul is thirsting for you. The Lord is wisdom himself. So with wisdom, we, we seek after it, and then um, wisdom will give uh, flesh for uh, our uh, our pines, our yearning, okay, for our soul thirst. So wisdom is like uh, it quenches uh, the thirst of the soul, right? and the hunger of the flesh. And um, it gives life to the lifeless earth. Okay. So that's uh, the, the fruit of wisdom. And that's why we yearn, we thirst for wisdom. And it gives us courage and strength and uh, um, protection. 
Let's move to number uh, three reading, which is the second reading from St. Paul, the first letter of St. Paul to the Thess Thess Thessalonian. So um, this is this passage, uh, chapter four, verse uh, 13 to 18, is in line with the theme of um, the gospel today. Okay, so you have wisdom, which is our means to an end. Wisdom is um, um, the meat, the strength, the energy for us to prepare ourselves, to prepare ourselves to confront the ultimate end. Okay, it is the energy for us, the source of uh, the resource for us to uh, prepare ourselves. So, the um, the reading from Thessalonians, First Thessalonians, is about knowing and being aware. Um, and this is the exhortation for us to be awake, alert, aware, attentive, so we could be attuned and alive. And what is the objective of being aware, of being prepared? The objective is to wait for the Lord. Okay. So let's move to the last reading, which is the gospel. I will proclaim it now. Before we go to the second phase, we, we are proclaiming the gospel according to Matthew chapter 25, verse 1 to 13. The Lord be with you all. And with, and with your spirits. spirits. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Glory to you, Lord. Oh, Lord. Jesus told his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones, when taking their lamps, brought no oil. With them. But the wise brought flasks of oil with their lamps. Since the bridegroom was long delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, there was a cry Behold, the bridegroom! Behold, the bridegroom! Come out and meet him. Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise ones replied, No, for there may not be enough for us and you. Go instead to the merchants and buy some for yourselves. While they went off to buy it, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went into the wedding feast with him. Then the door was locked. Afterwards, the other virgins came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he said in reply, Amen. I say to you, I do not know you. Therefore, stay awake, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord, Jesus Lord Jesus Christ. So thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this Gospel and this time to study you. So let's move to the second phase. We have three people here. So um, we'll share what we heard, listened, uh, or uh, accumulated or re uh, recorded, okay? And then uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the implication for you. So what is the point of the homily, or the homily and uh, so what, okay? So let's start with the person who is in the car. <laughs> okay, yes. Father. Um, I you got uh, on the car in the car. 
I'm in the car. <laughs> I'm not on but the car. I'm in in the car. order to be in the car, you have to get on the car. Well, and actually, you say I'm, I'm getting in the car. You're yeah. getting in the car. Yeah. But in order to get in the car, you have to get on the car. Yeah, I guess. Once yeah. you get on the car, you're in the car. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. when you pin me down to to specifics in English, father, it gets difficult because it's yeah. uh. It changes a lot. Anyway, I listened um, on my way to church, actually. Um, I was listening to uh, Relevant Radio, which is a Catholic radio, and mm -hmm. they had mass on. And it was a, a priest from St. Francis Xavier Church in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. I never mm -hmm. got his name, uh, but I, I listened to his homily, and I liked it over the one that I listened to at church. So uh, um, here it goes. He started off by saying that for those people who live in Two Rivers, Wisconsin, they know they have the knowledge that you can you have to carry a jacket with you all the time uh, because it can be hot one moment and then all of a sudden it gets cold just because the, the temperature drops. And so they're prepared, right? They have a jacket because no one's going to share their jacket with you when it gets cold. And he said this kind of reminded him of what it was like in the Wild West. You know, when you uh, bought tickets on the stagecoach, uh, there was the first class uh, uh, tourists and they paid lots of money and they never got out of the coach. They just stayed there. So if, the, if the, they had trouble with the coach, they still would stay there. They wouldn't move because they had uh, paid for an expensive ticket. Mm -hmm. There was the second class of travelers, which they got out and would just kind of let the driver do all the work, right, to, to help with whatever problems they had. And then there was the third ones uh, that had paid very little for their ticket, but they had to get out and push, right? And so there were three different uh, tourists that were on the stagecoach. And he said, it's kind, it's kind of like when you're on a pilgrimage. You know, you go on a pilgrimage, and you want to come back a different person. But some people go on the pilgrimage as tourists. And they go shopping and just kind of seeing the sights. And they just kind of go along for the ride, like the first class uh, uh, tourists, you know, on, on the stagecoach. They just go for the ride. And somebody else does all the work. And he said, our spiritual life is kind of like that. You know, we can either want to grow and become uh, more spiritual and get closer to God. Or we can just kind of go along for the ride. And he says, and so what, uh, so he, uh, he posed the question, what would you do? And they told you you had just one day to live. Well, you start making preparations, right? Calling the family and, and calling the kids and so forth. And he said, kind of like, that's the, what it's like to, to uh, be invited to the kingdom of God. For those that were prepared, are prepared to go, uh, they uh, have their lamps lit. And the lamps he referred to is all the spiritual resources that you needed to um, reach the heaven. And he says that these are prayer, Bible, adoration, confession, uh, receiving the sacraments, uh, Eucharist, and all these keep the, the, the candle or the lamps lit or, or, or keep our spiritual life going. And so therefore we stay awake and we're ready for whenever the Lord calls us. And so he said that this is what we need to do. We need to um, um, uh, store up our spiritual resources. And uh, from the spiritual resources, we uh, get um, the, the virtues of forgiveness, love, charity, and hope. And it's something you can't share with anybody. It's, it's there for you because you you did all the work you weren't just there for the ride you actually did all the work and um uh, people were um you know everyone had to take care of themselves so he, the question is do you want to be the five wise virgin or do you want to be the five unwise virgins um and so the what for me is um uh am i using all the proper spiritual resources uh to help me get closer to god uh, my, my goal is to go to heaven, of course, but why do I want to go to heaven? It's because I want to be with God. Uh, and the so what is, do I just rattle off a whole bunch of prayers and a checklist and I go, I do this, I do this, I do this, I do this and, and, and be done with it? Uh, or do I have that checklist, the, the, those resources for my spiritual life, but do I live it? And you know, do I actually allow people to see what it's like to 
uh, be and, 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 and search for the kingdom of God or to be in the, uh, in the kingdom of God here on earth. And that now what is, um, as with every now what's for me, I will try to be a better person. I will try to put all these things to, to good use that, that I learned in the homily and uh, that I'm going to learn in the um, face CBS. That's it, Father. Okay, thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Father. What is his name again? I didn't Father. catch his name. Yeah. Uh, relevant, uh, relevant radio. This is very relevant. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And this yeah. imagery is very well thought or um, reflected. And um, thank you, Father, for sharing us your awareness of where you are. He knows exactly uh, where he was. And um, thank you for telling us the situation in, is this in Wisconsin, right? Yeah, he, he was uh, from Two Rivers, Wisconsin. Two Rivers. So, uh -huh. yeah, it's, uh, it's, it, yeah, it's like that in around that area uh, in Canada, the same thing in Melbourne, Australia, the same thing. You always come prepared. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So very good imagery. So the imagery of uh, of the coat, you go out, like you, you carry the coat and also the image of uh, going on a tour, uh, coach, right? Your first class, is that a middle class? Yeah, it was a first class, the middle class, which you just paid a little bit, you know, less. And then the third class, which is like, you know, is that, you is did that all the true? Work. You go, is that, is that a third class, a third class and then uh, middle class? Is that true? Well, or you have um, economy and you have first class and you have business? Is that the word? Yeah, uh -huh. I, I don't know. Uh, but mm -hmm. in, in the old days, that's basically what it was, especially like I, I traveled a lot in South America. And that's basically mm -hmm. what it was. You had first class, second class and the third class. You sat with all the animals. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, so, yeah. yeah. You, you come prepared with the animals, you know. Exactly. What you like. <laughs> but the first class, you don't know what you're going to get. Right. You won't know right. what you get. Hey, yeah, they say that, but you don't know. Yeah. Right. Maybe That's bad, true. good, maybe not good, but you're not prepared because everybody's going to take care of you because you give them the money. That is a very good imagery to prepare ourselves. It reflects what Jesus is telling us to do. Right. But okay. let's, let's go back to that later on. Thank you, Olivia. And thank you, Father. Relevant radio. Okay, right, right. so let's move to Christina Hua, which means flower. Oh, and Huang means wow. king of the flowers. <laughs> Thank Huang, you, Father. Huang. Yeah, yes. Christina. Okay, Christina no, comes from Christ as well, but in the feminine form of Christ, Christina. <laughs> yeah, flower, the king flower of Christ. Okay, so your turn. Okay. Share, thank please. You, yes, thank you, everyone. <clears throat> well, I want to start uh, with the story I heard from Deacon Fong Nguyen from uh, Our Lady of Lourdes. Um, he started out with the story, uh, this man, he, he is rich and he lived alone and he bought a plot out in the cemetery before he died. He just visited every day and water the flowers and bring the flowers each day. And he said, the reason he wanna do it because when he die, he cannot see the flowers. He cannot enjoy the flower. Then they go to the funeral home and buy the casket that he wanted to choose for when he died. And that's the start of the story. But I wanna share the, the homily today is from Father Peter Wood at St. Michael Church in Houston. And this is 32nd Sunday on every time year two, uh, year A, I'm sorry. Um, he said the November month is very special. We start out with the feast day of all saints on November 1st and then November 2nd for all the souls. And he said that we all call to prepare, prepare for this and be ready to go when our time comes. Spend our times on earth terribly and fruitfully. When the bridegroom comes, when Jesus Christ knocks on our door, we all well prepared and ready. And he used a verse uh, from John 14, um, um, section two in my father's house there are many dwelling places if there were not so I would not have I would have told you because I go to prepare a place for you and if I shall go and prepare a place where I will come again and will take you to myself and then and where I am you also may be what a wonderful way to look at death truthfully we all belong to God when we receive our baptism 
We already belong to Jesus Christ when we are baptized. And this is our first sacrament that we receive. It's better to belong to God than to sin. The original sin, Adam and Eve, were sinned against God. The humankind's our lives were lost to sin. And Jesus came down to earth and died on the cross for our freedom and salvation. All the saints have been faithful to God and they raised <clears throat> and are awarded for their faith and works. For the souls um, that are still in purgatory, we, they need still need prayers, uh, our prayers. Um, the attitude which God asks from each one of us is that of loving, uh, loving vigilance, as Jesus teaches uh, in today's gospel, Matthew 25, verse 1 to 13, where he compares the kingdom of heaven to 10 virgins who took their lambs and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish virgins, in contrast with the wise one, neglect, neglected to bring extra oil for their lambs and were excluded from the wedding feast when the bridegroom <clears throat> finally arrived. Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he said in reply, Amen, I say to you, I do not know you. Jesus invites us all to prepare ourselves to enter the eternal wedding feast. And he reminds us, stay awake. For you know neither day or nor the hours from Matthew 25 verse 13 and he says stay awake be vigilant with the light of faith and the oil of charity the parable and centers on the attitude one should adopt <clears throat> up to the time when the bridegroom comes in other words it's not sufficient to know that one is inside the kingdom that one belongs to the church one has to be on the watch and be preparing for god's for christ's coming by doing good works and by fulfilling god's will Anything which implies indifference to God's will, living life for oneself and living for this world will constitute a spiritual slumber which would lead to nefarious consequences at the end of one's life. The vigilance with which God invites us to live should be continuous and untiring because the devil is always after us, prowling around like a rolling lion seeking someone to devour. This is uh, 1 Peter 5 verse 8. When our time comes, we do not want to hear from our Lord those words. Amen, I say to you, I do not know you. Why there is time, there is hope. Our Lord is in his bountiful mercy, continues to seek us out and give us the opportunity to mend our ways. In this gospel, I learned some of the bridegroom were not ready. The bridesmaid, I guess. They, were, they had the lamps, but no oil, no substance. The door to the wedding feast were closed and locked. No one can help us at the time of death except what we had done during our lifetime. We need to reconcile to God and be committed to practice to the faith, hear the words of God and act on it. Salvation applies to all of us. We should not be missed out on the eternal life. Don't become cold and lukewarm and forget the happiness await for us. Be prepared when God comes. He who lives wisely is a person who lives in Christ and dies in Christ. And he used the John verse, um, John 3, verses 16 to 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Amen. Thanks. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Christina. Uh, could you summarize that homily in one sentence for us? One sentence. Be prepared. Okay. Very good. So, so what? What's the point? How is it relevant? It's tell us that God can come anytime that okay. we don't know the hour. Right? Very we good. Do. So, and then, uh, okay. And then that, uh, that homily, you're reading from his homily or you summarize it. How did you get all the quotes from his homily? Is that his homily you're reading? Or yeah, you are... yeah. I have to search because it, he talks so fast. But he used those words. He used. He mentioned okay. all those. Words. So, yeah. so yeah. you're 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 really reading his homily. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we prefer that you take that, and um, we've been doing this for a long time. We practice the art of summarizing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instead of reading the verbatim mm -hmm. from uh, you know whoever priest, bishops, or pope, or president, uh, we have to digest it. Mm -hmm. That's too much. Yeah. Quoting too much. 
and uh, it gives the impression that uh, we are knowledgeable, but we don't understand what we are saying. Each of the quote is has a tremendously uh, profound implications, many implications. So uh, quoting the Bible is easy, okay? Mm -hmm. But we prefer the way Jesus uh, evangelized, simple, not simplistic. And uh, we have to ask ourselves how many quotes from the Bible did Jesus use when he preached? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did Jesus quote a lot of Bible? He did. The devil liked to quote the Bible. Mm -hmm. huh? And they quoted. And, and then Jesus said, okay, you quote it. And, then, and they came, the scholars would come to Jesus and say, oh, how do you get the authority? And then they quote the Bible on him. But he, he just teach it straight from uh, the heart of God, right? He used parables. Uh, the scholar, you know, scholarly people would quote a lot. And they smash your head or your face with coatings. And uh, the impression is that, um, well, since I'm coding, so I'm more knowledgeable, I'm more intelligent, I'm better than you. You don't quote, mm -hmm. you don't know the Bible. And the implication is that way. And you feel you go away, you feel so stupid because you're so smart, you're so knowledgeable about the Bible. But then that's why we're not condemning, but we are pointing out the, you know, the reality of, uh, of that. Doing that uh, in, in the writing, if you write an essay or research or a meditation, um, a kind of an article or something like that, no problem. But preaching and quoting, and people don't even know the quotes and quoting the numbers and the verses. Since we're studying, that's no problem. Okay. But when, when the, we talk like that, people get uh, they get distracted easily. Okay, so we prefer we prefer the way. Okay, what is the point? Get to the point. What is relevant? How is relevant to me? And you elaborate, you illustrate. That's it. But it is your own word. And every day we learn more and more the way you know Papa works. Uh, we we do that. It's alive. It's not just uh, uh, we use this again and again. Um, we do not bring the frozen chicken out of the freezer and put it on the table and ask everybody to eat it. And that is um, that is, is not edible, right? So anytime you quote something to illustrate something, to elaborate something, that quote has to put into context and it takes a lot of long time to study it whether it fits or not. or So there are two ways to study the Bible or to interpret the Bible, eisegesis or exegesis. And we study this for a long time. Eisegesis is, I have my point. I use all the Bible course to illustrate my point. Or you have the word of God, the truth of God, and you use everything to elaborate on the word of God. Okay, so there are two ways. The Jesus way normally is not really focusing on God, on the truth. It focuses on the person or whatever the person wants to say. And you take from the word of Jesus, the truth of Jesus, and then you use everything to illustrate it. Yeah, even psychology, politics, or sociology. And I'm repeating myself again and again, the technique we, uh, we use, it's better that way. Okay, is, is that okay with you, Christina? Yes. Yeah. So it's easy. I could read you, you know, like 10 <laughs> minutes or 15 minutes. Anybody could do that. And a lot of people uh, did that before. And this is why it is not easy to study the Bible this way because we just uh, quote it from what we heard, but not processed. Right? Uh, we call it the uh, cane food, food from the, the, the cane. Right? And so um, we prefer... And we'd rather have uh, a little, uh, but enough mm -hmm. than have too much, but not healthy. Okay. So that's the way we do it. But thank you for taking the time to do research and, and to listen to his homily. So the point is to prepare. Okay. The point is to prepare. But and then uh, by uh, for me personally, by the time I hear too many quotes as a priest, uh, I got distracted too much. 
Because, okay, that code is in that context and this John is not in Luke, it's not in Matthew, it's not in the Acts, it's not Paul, but Paul is different, you know, from different scenario. He's a missionary, he was a Pharisee, he's a Pharisee, and he's going to have a, his own style of writing. And Luke was not a Jew, he was a Greek, and he's a physician, so he's going to write it in that context. And then you take from Paul and you talk to Luke, who is, you know, this student, disciples, Paul, okay, you no know, problem, they're connected, and you got so distracted. You take one part from Luke, who is a doctor, and you put it in, in Matthew's context, and then you're going to be, you know, confusing. Yeah? So we, we respect the context. Yeah? We respect. So uh, whatever happened in Mexico, we say, oh, that's, and then you, you interpret it from the American Texan, the gay point of view, oh, you're in trouble. Like you go to Mexico and say, uh, you have any burrito? <laughs> burrito comes from Mexico. Say, what, 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 what? <laughs> burrito? What is burrito? <laughs> Do you have burrito in Mexico? No. <laughs> we, we, we just, you know, just the American experience and then burrito is, yeah, but that's Mex, okay? It's, it's not Mexico. Yeah, something like that. So we, we got really confused and we assume that's Mexican. No. Yeah. So whatever I speak right now, you know, Vietnamese culture in America is so different from Vietnamese culture in Australia or in, in the in the Netherlands or in Vietnam, Vietnam, right? So we have to really respect the context. That's why we rather have something not simplistic, simple, so chewable, right? Edible. So thank you. And for that uh, summaries of being prepared because we do not know when the Lord is coming. Okay, thank you. That's the point we're going to study today. Okay, and how. Okay. Let's move on. Thank you, Christina, for your you know hard work. And uh, let's move to Denise. Okay, so I listened to three homilies this weekend, but Wonderful. I I am going to report on, I guess, the most significant the one that I understood the best uh, yeah. from Father Christopher Meyer. He is from St. Faustina's. Mm -hmm. He spoke on. Um, so the question is, in your mind, what is the point? Okay. Yes. What is the topic? Amen. I say to you, okay. I Whatever. do not know you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's what he basically spoke on. That was how his point. Okay. And so he used the psalm, uh, I will remember you upon my couch, um, and through the night watches, I will meditate on you. You are my help. He used the psalm and spoke on the psalm on how we can be ready that's what the point was and okay. so uh he said we need to spend more time in communion with the lord in prayer uh praising and blessing his holy name mm -hmm. and um so what i took from this is that in all trials in everything um Thank God for his holy will and bless his name and thank him for everything. Okay. And something that comes to mind that he didn't speak of was um, if God can give us so many blessings, and I don't know who said this or what, I, I think it was a saint, um, then why would we not accept the evil he allows also? Yeah. Job. Yes. Yes. The book of Job. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so you have the point. Um, I do not know you. That's the point. Yes. Okay. And um, you. You say how that? is it relevant to you? And how did he elaborate it? According to your understanding. How did he elaborate that point? So when um, when the wise virgins came 
and yeah. uh, the bridegroom was there uh he said will you be one of the virgins that is out going to get oil or are you going to be one of the virgins that is ready and so which so, part are you <laughs> so i you know that's what i've been meditating on because mm -hmm. I, you know there are things that i can do uh, mm -hmm. you know pray go to daily mass but then i have my own vices you know the things that i do on a daily basis that you know will the lord catch me doing one of those things like okay. um being on my phone uh doing you know scrolling through facebook or whatever it is or will he catch me doing things for him that are good so that's and he how he elaborated on that he he brought in Tom, uh thomas merton uh when the bridegroom comes communicate with him with word no, uh he, he basically brought us into how Thomas Merton uh, explained being in communion with Jesus and how uh, we could be with him without words, without thought, without anything. And just being there with him, we would know Jesus. And then he, um, he brought in the Pokemon movie because uh, he loved Pokemon as a child. And, you know, how people, we have all have our vices where we like things so much and these things take us away from uh, the Lord. And then what will we be doing to cultivate uh, all the gifts he has given us? Are we di uh, kept, you know, into that vice of uh, being distracted away from the purpose that God has for us? I will remember you upon my couch. And he kept you know, that was like uh, something he kept reminding us of going back to the psalm, going back to meditating on uh, God and all the good that he has done uh, and thanking him always praising his holy name. So, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. So elaborations with the Pokemon. <laughs> That's... Yeah, so he, he, as a child in, um, and it's funny because the homily he was speaking, he said, he looked it up just to make sure, but he, you know, he wanted to go see this Pokemon movie that was just coming out and it came out on November 12th, 1999. Oh. And it was November 12th when he was saying the homily. <laughs> So yeah. it was it was it was a good homily. It was funny, mm -hmm. it was real mm -hmm. and yeah. um, had some good advice. So yeah. okay. thank you, Father. What is his name again? I forgot his name. Christopher Meyer. Okay. But, this is only you, his second year, yeah. I think. Okay. Christopher Meyer, that's a good name, huh? That yeah. sounds really Good carrier, bearer of uh, carrier of God of Christ, yeah, Meyer. Thank you, Father Christopher Meyer, and thank you, Denise, for sharing what you you recorded and re, you, know, you just reported. Thank you. So now let's go back to the gospel, and um, we need to readjust our attitude in studying. Okay. Okay. And uh, my face is a lot of light on my face. This side, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Is that okay? I think That's it's okay. What no, happened? It's, it's the sun. No, the sun is shining on my face. So really, no. Yeah. So I did it on purpose. Kiakuro, kiakuro. That means this is bright and this is shadow. So light and shadow. That's an art way, uh, the kind of uh, one of the, uh, uh, I think, uh, who, who was that? Uh, I forgot the name. Uh, yeah, he, he invented that art. So now let's go back to the attitude to study. Let's understand this or listen to, um, to ourselves and uh, understand this. As we 
listen to the word of God. This is not about the studying the Bible yet, but the studying, studying. Okay. So number one, when we listen, I'm repeating myself again. When we study the commandments, and as you know, we know there are two greatest, the three greatest commandments. Okay. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and might, right? Strength. And love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? right? Two or one. And then you have Jesus saying, love one another as I love you. Okay. But in fact, in the, um, before you get to that two commandments, love God above all and your neighbor as yourself, you love yourself. There's uh, the um, pre-commandment, which is also a commandment, a command. The beginning was Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel. So that mm. is commandment. The first commandment is to hear. And after you are able to hear because he was calling the Israelites, okay? He was naming them, calling them you, not the Egyptians, not the Babylonians, not, you know, the, the Persian. No, no, no. Not the Americans, not the Vietnamese. Israel. He called them by name here. And then after you do that, you could, okay, now this is a commandment. You hear the first commandment, love God or worship God, and then love your neighbors. You love yourself. Without, that is a true commandment, okay? Here is an act, active, okay? Active verb, here. It is both external and internal. Okay, now we're studying the method of studying. Now, let's listen to this. I have said this uh, again, a repetition. Everybody could learn, even animals could learn. The animal learns by pain. The Africans would have the saying, they, they have this kind of saying, I may repeat it uh, incorrectly, but it is the gist of it. It says, as the sun rises, okay, whether you're a lion or gazelle, you run. Remember? Yes. Yeah? You're a lion or gazelle. The morning sun rises, you run. Right? The lion runs after food and the gazelle runs so not, it will not become food for the lion. So we run. You get healthy. Okay, I repeat that. So the gazelle learns that if you do not run, you become food for the lions. The lion learns that if you don't run quicker than the slowest of all the gazelle, you'll be hungry, starving. Yeah, the animal learns by instinct. So learning is normal. Okay, even the plants learn. The trees learn. They learn how to uh, where, you know, take roots. If there's water, it's going to grow the root to where it's water. So it's wetness. And it's going to grow up to where you have sunlight. Right? It learns. Even computer learns, yeah? Mm -hmm. But to study something belongs to the intelligent beings like human beings. We study. Only human beings are able to really study. I'm not talking about learning, okay? Children, they learn, but hopefully we teach them to study. And this is called study, Bible study. And study... Uh, there's something that is very personal and private. I cannot study for you. Okay? You can only study for yourself. And it, it, it's the employment of uh, the application of your own intelligence, your own mind, or your own reason. And so reasoning belongs to you. A lot of people in today's world, they don't use their mind, they don't reason, they just... Uh, learn a trick or two and perform and act as if they know. But when you ask questions, they don't know how to respond. Now, you could learn a lot of quotes from the Bible. And whenever uh, whenever people ask, oh, I, I quote this one, I quote that one, I quote the one, they use pound on people's head with this quote. God said so, God says so, God says so. But you ask the question, what does it mean? Where does it come from? What does it imply? How many implications? How many significance? What is the value? And the person would not know because they do not study it. Okay? 
are we still together now? Yes. Oh, okay. So this is this is not easy. The work of the mind, the worshiping of the Lord with the mind is um, takes effort. And so this is how you own what you have. So learning is accumulation, but owning it, okay, really become the master of it takes, you know, effort and intelligence. So you could get a car at home or a piano home. Okay, I bought it. It's mine. Yeah, right. But you don't learn how to play the piano. You don't own it. You don't know how to drive the car. You don't own it. Only you could learn the skill to drive the car, the skill to play the piano. So that study, tech study. Okay. Now the way uh, we we learn something. This is the old way or the the the, the normal way. The used way is this, um, I go to a piano teacher. I take some classes, and I tell the teacher these are the songs I want to learn, and then. I learned it by heart, maybe 10 of them, 20 of them. And I could learn it by heart. And I come out and then I close my eyes, just play it. Oh, wonderful. You're a wonderful you know, pianist. No, 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 no. You play, but you don't understand what you're playing. Mm -hmm. I had like a machine and the machine computer could play better than, than us. We learned it by heart. But in, in fact, we learned my memory, what memory, not heart. Until you understand why you play that note, why you use the index finger instead of the pinky, and you know, you know the structure of, of your arm and uh, your shoulder and the disposition of your heart. It is not just learning by rote memory; it's studying everything, and that's really owning it, mastering it, and that takes a lot of effort and intelligence. Okay, and commitment is called studying it. And that, that's how you master, you, you own it really. It becomes you, yeah? So uh, this is hard work, it's not easy. But in the, the majority of the people, uh, you could see this is, this is um, an observation. It may be right, it may be wrong, be true or false, but the majority of people prefer just to get on the internet and listen to homilies and you just regurgitate whatever, whoever says whatever on the internet. But they don't study it. They don't think uh, think about it. And whether it's right or wrong, I agree or disagree. Oh, it's the father said. It's uh, the Pope said. Oh, yeah. Father Michael said it. Mm -hmm. And immediately, oh, yeah, that has to be infallible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, 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 no. It may be infallible. Because the truth, the revealed truth, however, do you understand it? Why is it infallible? Why is it true? Yeah. So we're talking about the process of studying, the method of studying something. Okay. So that means we have to be objective and the personal uh, emotion or uh, reaction should, uh, we should abstain from having uh, emotional uh, reaction or take it personally. Yeah. And that is really hard for today's uh, culture. So now let's go to the scripture. Tell me, again, this is a review. What is the distinction between a fairy tale, a fable, and a parable? <laughs> fable and fairy tale, how are they different? Fable and fairy tale. So a fable is uh has a lesson to be learned a fairy tale is with like people and um our fable is also with animals and a lesson to be learned uh a fairy tale is like with people and um has a happily ever after <laughs> okay <laughs> that's, that's true that's true okay that's true okay anybody else has uh, make a distinction between the fable and fairy tale yes Olivia. I, yeah i thought a fable was all animals 
Okay, very good. Fairy tale is is people. You know, they're humans. Okay. Yeah, very good. So we are teachers. We are mothers and fathers and uh, teachers. We teach, and the best way to teach those who are not uh, knowledgeable, ignorant people like children, students. Okay, and I'm a student as well. So uh, teaching means you are bringing a person from the the state of uh, not knowing to a state of knowing. Yeah, from ignorance to knowledge. Okay. And then, because you are right now, for instance, Olivia, you know a lot about uh, medicine, okay? You have been practicing it for a long time. You're retired. So in order to bring me to where you are and you experience it, you know it, you practice it, it is not easy because I don't know what you're talking about. So you have to lower yourself down and use the imagery in my own circumstance, in my own situation, my environment, and use that imagery to talk about something that I never know. So I could, you know, from that, you use examples. It's something that's similar to my experience. Yeah. So uh, if you teach a little child, a little baby about um, the numbers, okay, calculus, it's going to be so hard. Yeah. Yes, so you have yes. to use examples. Okay. Comparing you know, use oranges and apples and all those things. They could see, they could feel, they could smell, right? But people tend to stay there only. Examples, okay? It's something similar. However, and then you put those imagery into a story, okay? And uh, fables, normally we read the fables, the Aesop fables, you know, Aesop's fable. Those are little kids, because they like to play with the ants and the uh, grasshopper and the dogs and the cats and the turtle and the rabbits, right? They're near to nature and little uh, animals and they talk to them. So you write those fables for children and um, the animals are able to talk. Yes. And you move up to another level, we have uh, fairy tales. Fairy tales are for a little bit older kids. Uh, you are there. You know, you're not part of the animals and you look, you're an outsider, an audience, a listener. You see all the animals, the, the rabbits. Or oh, is that is that the hare and the turtle, right? They will compare. They would uh, have a, a tournament, a contest who's faster, right? So mm. the point was not about who's faster, uh, who's resistant, right? So the child would, stand outside as an audience and observe, no problem. But then fairy tale, you get to participate. So Snow White, oh, you're the Snow White. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the seven dwarfs and the witch, the wicked witch, like the apple and all those things. And also the prince come in, in the rescue of the damsel in, dis, you know, in despair, in disguise or whatever, desperation. Right, so yeah, fairy tale. You got to participate in it. Fable, you're outside, but you learn a lesson. Fairy tales. Some animals talk to you. Some fairy tale fairies talk to you. Angels come talk to you. Even the tree talk to you. But you are the main character. Okay. But each of them, you could have uh, many morals to a fairy tale. You could look at it from the perspective of the dwarves, dwarves or perspective of Snow White, the prince or the wicked uh, witch, okay? You have many stories. Oh, don't be like the wicked witch, okay? What did she do? Oh, be like Snow White, something like many, many lessons. Fables, normally, yeah, maybe there's a moral. Okay, persistent, okay? Don't give up. You're slow, but don't give up, something like that. But then you move to the parable. The parable has only one point. And then Jesus is the one who uses parable. Okay. So let's go to this parable. And you, uh, if you could give a title to this parable, parable how would you give? How, what, is, what title would you give? Okay, Christina, you think you could give a title to the parable?
Are you talking about the parable that we just learned today? Yeah. yeah. Give a title, a name to the, the one name, short name to the parable, a phrase, or a name to the parable. So this is thinking and studying, right? So we are employing our mind, our reasons, our intelligence, our imaginations to, to think about it. We really think about it. So, and then that means when we give a name, we have to summarize it in such a way. It's not it's just in, in a paragraph or a sentence, it's in a title, right? So take time to think, let's think about it, okay? How about, how would you uh, tie untitle or give a title to the parable today, Denise? I would call it the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. Okay, that's, that's a name, that's a title. Okay, working title. How about Olivia? How would you, you uh, name it? Title. I would. Yeah, I would name it. Be prepared. Be be prepared. Yeah, but that's the point. That's the point. But the parable. We're talking about story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the lesson. Uh, but it doesn't oh. sound like a name of a story. Parable is a story. So how right. would you name the story? Yeah, it's not a fairy tale. It's not a fable, a yeah. parable, but it's a story. Okay, the foolish a, virgins. The foolish virgin. So you're gonna focus uh, focus on the foolish virgin, foolish virgin, and the um, niece will be. Uh, you're focusing on the uh, the tender, wise, and foolish virgin, right? So that that's a good title, working title, both of them. And so by naming the title. We know where your focus uh, is placed, right? Mm -hmm. And foolishness are both wise and foolish, okay? And virgin, okay? So, and uh, Christina, have you come up with any title for the parable, which is a story? I guess when we, we say uh, when Jesus comes, the, the last day. Well, we're, that that is not the, in the what parable. The story. What is the name? You give a name, a title for yeah. the story. It's not the lesson. It's not the no, point. Not the the, yeah. So uh, the wedding the, feast. The wedding feast. Wedding. Okay, that's good. That's good. Also, the yeah. wedding feast. So you okay. could also yeah. just not say wise and foolish. You could just say the ten virgins. Oh, you could say that. Okay. But uh, you have one title, now you have another working title. And then uh, Christina has a title as a wedding feast, okay? And then the, that title is very broad, the wedding feast, because there are many wedding feasts, terrible. Yeah, so you think about it, this studying, how we're going to approach it. And when you approach it as a wedding feast, then uh, what is a wedding, wedding feast? The king who organized a wedding for his son, or what kind of weddings? There's too many, uh, so many weddings, right? The kingdom of heaven is like the king who throw a party for his son, wedding feast for his son, or the wedding feast. Is it about the wedding or about something else? So however you name it, that's your focus. And your focus is going to be your, your standpoint or your point of view, your perspective. That's how you read it, okay? And you could read it from many standpoints, okay? Point of view. Uh, we call a vintage point, right? Where wherever you are. Okay. Point of okay. So let's take a look at it. What is the main character, the main focus of this parable? For Jesus, what was he what was he aiming at? The kingdom the of heaven. Are you looking for a the main character, not the main character. point? Okay. Oh. Let's study the, the parables, okay? okay? We're studying the parables. We're not studying the, the, the oh. meaning yet. Yes. The yes. bridegroom. The bridegroom. The bridegroom. Okay. Number one focus is the bridegroom. Anybody else has a different uh, take on it? The bridegroom. Where's the main character? So in the story, you have the um, protagonist and you have the main character. Okay. I, I agree with Olivia, the bridegroom. Okay, the bridegroom. Okay, so that's one. Uh, you, you don't have any other 
So when you ask about the main character, that means that is the focus of a story. Okay. Okay. So for me, since we're studying together, there is a there's a song called "Like a Virgin." <laughs> oh, that that song. was uh, um, what's her name? Oh, what's her name? <laughs> what was her name? Madonna. Madonna. There you go. So there you go. I would I would <laughs> entitle this parable as "Like a Virgin." Like a virgin. Oh, but. You probably would get more people reading it. <laughs> really? This is what Jesus said. Like 10 virgins. So that's my take. Okay. Okay. His point like is it. about like a virgin or like the virgins. Instead of like a virgin, you say like the virgins. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's that. my focus is on the word, the word like. And the implication is this, well, when you say like, you have to compare something with something else. And the best way to clarity, to clarification is to compare and to contrast. Uh, it's really studying it, isn't it? Yes. How do I know that I'm good at speaking English? Well, I have to compare to you, Olivia. And you have to compare your speaking English, you know, years and years, and maybe hundreds of years studying English for you. You know, if you, you include really hundreds of years. <laughs> How old do you think I am, Father? <laughs> no, no, no. The, I mean the knowledge, the amount of knowledge, you know, that you have with oh, okay. medicine gotcha, and all those gotcha. things, and uh, patience, and, and the accumulating, uh, accumulating uh, uh, amount of wisdom you can encounter with your patients. You know, hundreds of years, and me just. Uh, the toddler or something, so you compare and okay, hey, what are you enunciate that you pronounce it incorrectly because I compare, right? So it's clarifying, contrasting. This is how you say it, this is how you say it, and this is the correct way, this is the wrong way. So you contrast. Clarity comes from comparing, comparison, and contrast. So the word like is a comparison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or unlike is a uh, contrast. Okay, so like the virgins. Yeah, and uh, you know what Jesus is yeah. comparing. What is he Jesus comparing? The kingdom of heaven. Okay, very good. That's the point. The kingdom of heaven will be like the ten virgins. Okay, now. Okay. When you get that point, the beginning, you get that point, like the virgin. The kingdom of heaven is like, will be like the ten virgins. Okay. That means in the kingdom of heaven, there are virgins. We, we slow it down, right? They're virgins. They're pure people. Okay. Taste people. Okay, and there are girls. Are they girls? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, some in the kingdom, there are foolish ones and wise ones. Okay, so where's the kingdom of heaven? On earth. Okay, so he's talking about something that nobody knows. It, trans it transcends the human experience and mind and imagination and uh, whatever intuition we have. So he's using the earthly, earthly language, human language, to compare. Virtually, these have to be pure, pure people in order to be worthy or to qualify in order to qualify to attend the wedding, right? Right? So these, they are qualified. They're invited. They were invited. Now let's take a look. In the kingdom of heaven, you do have uh, foolish ones and wise ones. Okay. So... Let's go back to reality. And we have done this before. You organize a wedding for your own son. Okay, Denise. 
Is he 30 years old now? No, not yet. 29? I think he's 28. 28, okay. And he better get married soon, right? So <laughs> tell him that, I tell him that, okay? <laughs> and he's getting to, to be better because he lost some weight. That's good. A lot of weight, okay? So suppose you and Ken, uh, parents organizing a wedding for your son, or he uh, organizes a wedding for himself, and um, on the side, your okay, on his side, the the the, uh, the man side, okay, the bridegroom. You would have your own what do you call it? Uh, um, bachelor party. Pre no, no, not bachelor party, but <laughs> at the wedding, you would have your what do you call it? The maids. Um, oh, the groomsmen groomsman and the bridesmaids. Yeah, bridesmaids mm -hmm. and uh, men's mates. Gro no, groomsmen. Groomsmen. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Friends. So you would choose those, you know, on the side of the, uh, the, the man, right? He would choose his friends or his brothers, his cousins. He know them. He, will, he, have, he has to know them. Mm -hmm. Right? It's part of family. You don't invite a stranger. Right? You would not know his friends, but he would know his friends. So he's supposed he invite 10 of them to be his uh, uh, groom's men. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, would he introduce them to you as parents? Who they were? Yeah, of course. Okay. And then, um, and on the side of, uh, of the bride, she would invite her friends or family, sisters or cousins. Okay, best friends to be her bridesmaid. She would introduce them to the family, her parents, right? Yes. And she, he, she would introduce them to her own, her groom as well. Yes. He should know. This is an hour, you know, our century's way of uh, organizing a wedding. Okay. And then if you don't do it as a pastor, I will make you do it. <laughs> because you have a day of a rehearsal. Everybody has to dress up and be there. Okay? Or else. Mm -hmm. You pay for it, you're not there. <laughs> you have like a re consequences. So the priests who um, perform or celebrate or uh, uh, witness the wedding has a day, two day, two day before, day before. Oh, everybody gathers. I need to know your face, who you are. Okay, everybody knows everybody and check hand and everything else and walk hand in hand, you know, all the procession into the church and limousine, whatever, where you stand, where you go, how you go, how you dress, everything. And the ritual, the rites, you have to prepare. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, how long do you have to prepare for a wedding? Normally for Catholics now, how long? A year? Yeah, a year. Yeah. Some people just go get married, that's it. As long as you have a big party, that's good. But for Catholics, at, at least a year, you get to know each other, you know, the, the man and the, the girl knows each other for a long time, maybe two, three years, five years, you know, and then uh, you get to know, and then uh, you go, you have to uh, uh, join the course on marriage preparation uh, for Catholics, and then you have to go on a retreat, and then you have to shadow uh, some couple who are experienced in the family life. At least that's what, what, what I do, right? You have a couple and that couple, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, fiancés, they have to follow these couples. And they um, have to share and do a lot of tests, okay? A lot of work to get married, okay? Preparation, okay, no problem. Now, that's a year. But go back to the context of uh, this parable. This is Jewish marriage. Okay. As uh, we know, we studied this, studied this before. You have the betrothal and you have the wedding and you have the marriage. Mm -hmm. The wedding is different from the marriage. Marriage becomes a marriage when you have consummation. 
Okay. So let's go back to the tradition. Everybody, imagine you are not American or Vietnamese or Mexicans or Hispanics, uh, Africans. You are in Greece. Yeah, Israel in Palestine at Jesus' time. And you're Jewish, you know the law. They have to be engaged already. They are already husband and wife, but they, are, they don't have their wedding. They don't have the really uh, the consummation of marriage yet. So the man got engaged to be trot to the woman, the virgin. He goes home, he builds his own, you know, house or whatever. A year later, when he's uh, competent and competence, he would come and, you know, bring the bride back home and has a wedding. Okay. Takes at least a year. Okay. They belong to each other already by law, legally. Okay. And then the, the, the bride would expect it. And when is going to come? Where is he going to come? Okay. And then you have the, the notice that he's coming tonight. And this is the week we're going to have our wedding. So it's exciting. And then so the bride would uh, prepare everything to welcome the groom. She would invite all her friends, her families, uh, you know, nieces, nephews, or uh, cousins, whoever, to come. And he's coming. He's going to come today. Okay. All right. So these um, bridesmaids, she knows. She knows them. And they know her. They should know who the bridegroom is. Okay. They know. They, they live in the same village. Everybody knows every, you know, everyone by face and by name. Okay, should be that way. Uh, if you don't know, you have to get to know. Okay? If you don't know, somebody's going to tell you. Okay, so um, they have to announce that marriage. Okay, so it comes. You look at the parable, there are many twists in it. So many twists in it. And this is what Jesus liked to do. Like the virgins. The focus is not on the bridegroom or the bride, or on the wedding. The focus is on the virgins. Yes or no? Yes. That's what Jesus said, like the virgins, the ten virgins. There's only one point, one focus for Jesus. Okay? So, you make an appointment, you're going to come today, and then you got into traffic, you know, there's a rush hour and there are too many cars in the street so the groom is late mm -hmm. and uh, if you go to church late on your wedding you know what is going to happen either the bridegroom get cold feet <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's going to marry me or no, oh, no. <laughs> he's not here you know, the song and the choirs and the organs or everybody drums and, you know, everybody dressed up and waiting for you and you're not coming. So you ask yourself, who is the bridegroom? Jesus. That's what we tend to assume. Yes. Mm -hmm. Always, every time you hear a master or a bridegroom, a groom, you say that's Jesus or God or the king. You, you, we just assume it's God. Is Jesus that narrow, or could that you know the groom is a groom, just a groom? Everybody knows a groom. They don't think of Jesus is a groom. Ask yourself the question: If you were the audience listening to Jesus at that time, would anybody, including the apostles, think that the groom is Jesus? At that moment. No. If you were the audience. No. They, they just say, okay, that's a groom. Everybody knows the, you know, the wedding rites, the ritual. The right. thing about the groom is the groom, not God or Jesus and anybody else. Because we, we are Catholics and we are indoctrinated, I would say the word. You know, so we, we are brainwashed into thinking it has to be Jesus. It has to be Jesus. It has to be God. King has to be God. Or and the master has to be God or Jesus. They have to think again. If you were at that moment with the people, they would not have that in mind. 
they don't even know Jesus is God yet. Mm-hmm. Even the disciples, including the disciples, okay, they say the groom is the groom is the groom. That's it. Simple. Okay. Now, that would make you really mad, you know. But still, they're waiting because the woman wants to get married. I have to wait, okay. Even if it has to be the next day, I have to wait. Wait, but <laughs> is, it, yes. is is that is that true that that the bride never knew when the groom was going to show up? Or no, 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 a... no, no. The report was that he came in late, right? Oh, so okay. there is okay. a there is a notice that I'm coming <laughs> to get the wife. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's long so delayed. there's a notice, but then you don't know when he's coming. You say, but he's coming late. And then we to twist this. This well, how late is gonna be? We've been waiting since noon. We prepare. We have everything else, and we know we're gonna wait, right? And they they wait, uh, and when the sun sets, that's the new day, and um, uh, they prepare everything. Everybody prepared, and they have their lamps with them or a torch, okay? And they bring along with them the flask of uh, oil. Everybody should have one. Okay, it's late, but okay. Uh, six o'clock in California right now is is dark. Four o'clock in London is dark. In the London in in Canada is dark. Four o'clock in the afternoon is really dark. Okay, and then the, by eight is really dark. You have no traffic light, like in a in a state. Many countries like that. So you have the torch and it's cold. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now he came in midnight, the middle of the night, midnight. What kind of groom is that? Is that Jesus? People would not think that was Jesus was implying himself. They don't have it in their mind yet. That that's the man who's telling the parable. They would think about the groom. And they would have a kind of a judgment, passing judgment, what kind of groom is this? Okay. But they still, uh, the family of the bride is very patient and they're waiting, they're excited. And, and um, what is a shame for the family really is uh, the culture of shame and honor. And if the, the groom is not coming, it's a shame for the whole family. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> very shameful. Okay. So he came. Right. But because they have been waiting for so long, they fell asleep, all of them. The bridesmaid fell asleep. Is that anything wrong with it? Is there anything wrong with falling asleep? No. I don't think so. Is, should you feel guilty when you fall asleep? When you're tired? You're waiting for, for the wedding, for the bridegroom to come and you fall asleep. Oh, it's okay if it's late and you're tired, you've been waiting. Okay, mm-hmm. so the bride's groom is coming. There's the good news. They wake up. Okay, look around. We have burned our oil. No more oil. All of them ran out of light, right? But the wise one, the five wise one, had the oil. And uh, the not so wise forgot or did not bring the oil. No problem. That is the scenario. But the twist is this. They turn around to their bridesmaid. They should know each other, okay? All the bridesmaids, they know each other. They're like sisters. They're, they're, you know, they're the family. And the five uh, not-so-wise one ask the other one, could you share? And the other five say, no. We've been waiting for with, with you for all day. And we want to share, no? You should be compassionate and charitable. And, and you know, so why not? You're so selfish. How could you be our friends? That's what Father Christopher said. He said, um, for the, the virgins that wouldn't share their oil, um, this isn't very Christian. He said with a very straight face, he said, and that is why St. Faustina's has decided not to say this reading anymore. And he said, no, not really. 
<laughs> well, uh, we 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 draw the conclusion whether they are Christians or not. Okay, <laughs> right. are they Christians? Of course, they are not Christians. Right. Jesus telling the story to the Jews, and this is a this is a parable. So yeah. the twist is right there, and we use a Christian value to uh, pass judgment. Yes. yes. Yeah. No, no, no. Jesus did not mean that. Just they don't share. You're not so compassionate and charitable and all those things, and your friends and your family, and you don't share. And then there's a twist here. This is the, the master telling stories. Uh, they told uh, the wise one, no, oh, I have to keep mine, okay? We don't have enough for ourselves. Um, we're going to share, okay? No problem. They're not blaming them, blaming them for not bringing the oil. They just say we cannot share. But they give advice. So go, get your oil. Go to the merchant. Now imagine this. In the middle of the night, who opens the, the, the shop for you? Mm -hmm. Are there 24 hours Walmart or 7 Eleven or something like in the state? In a village, everybody falls asleep. Where are you going to get the oil? Is that not a twist? Number one, you don't have you have no oil, and you're worried. You won't be able to welcome the groom and get into the house, the wedding of the groom and the bride, right? Your friends or your family. Number two, there's the middle of the night. And these people say, oh, go get it. Where are you going to go get it? The advice sounds really good, but it's a challenge, you know. The focus, uh, yes. Tell, uh, where, yeah, where's the bride? We don't know. He's, that's the mastery of, 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 okay. of the master uh, storyteller. He just keep hiding. See, a parable is something that's hidden and revealing. He just hides something and he reveals something else. He's a master in telling in storytelling. Okay. Yeah, he, is. he doesn't say anything about the bride at all. Mm -hmm. We have to wonder where's the bride, right? That is Jesus for you. So we tend to simplify, you know, make Jesus so simplistic and like, oh no, it's profound. And no matter how we, we study him, we'll never reach his death. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now the twist is, is okay, go get your oil. Why are you going to get the oil in the middle of the night? Or oh, the stores are closed. Okay. It's not easy. So the focus was on the 10 virgins, okay, like the virgins. Now the focus, Jesus is putting the focus on the foolish ones. Is he not? So he's narrowing down our attention, okay? And here we are tuning to a situation of uh, the foolish virgins. They are in distress and distraught, okay? No oil. The problem is that we have no oil. And they have to be very, very inventive and innovative to go find where the oil are. They have no 24 seven, you know, open all night grocery stores or shops at all. They have to use their mind or their intelligence to, to where, go where to buy, to know where and how to go get the oil. Either they run home they go to the merchant as the wise, five wise uh, virgin told them to. In the middle of the night, okay, what do they do? They have to beg, knock at the door, okay, call, uh, be very, um, uh, what do you call it, impudence. Hmm? And as long as they get the oil. They work hard to get the oil, really. Look at them. Middle of the night. While they were get, going to get the oil. And that's their purpose. They have a purpose, they have a mission now. I'm going to get the oil. No matter what. No matter the cost. Five of them went together as a team. No? Yes. Why? Because 
we we want to we want to greet or welcome the groom. It's all for you, groom, and for the family. And they did it. And the groom came. And the groom, you know, and the the five wise one, the simply the the virgin with oil, the virgin without oil. That's it. Okay, the virgin with oil uh, came along, okay, with the bride and the bridegroom to the wedding. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, when they go, once they go and enter the wedding and they have a party there, these five virgins with the oil are toiling in the dark. Just look, they're looking for the oil. Merchants or homes, wherever, as long as they get the oil, so they could welcome the groom. Okay? And once they get the oil, how did they do it? Jesus never said. That's his mastery and storytelling. But he did, they, they did work hard for it. And then they run along. They know exactly where the bride, the bride's groom live. Didn't they? Mm -hmm. They went there straight to the house. To the they wedding. knocked at the door. Yeah. They worked really hard. Yeah, all night. And imagine. Your son, Denise, okay, on his wedding night or evening, after the mass is done, you go out for the party to a restaurant. And everybody, all the guests are in your family, you know, on the side of the, the bride and the bridegrooms, everybody's there. And on the side of the, you know, the newly uh, wed, um, the brides, uh, five um, bridesmaids are not there at the wedding, at mass or even at the, at the party. Okay? This is a twist. And you go to the restaurant and you close the restaurant. And these bridesmaids came in, knock at the door at the restaurant, at the wedding party. Okay? And people reported, so your son is the groom. Instead of sending his uh, sisters, whoever come out and say, no, 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 or invite them in, he himself came out. <laughs> That's interesting. Mm -hmm. He himself came out. He forget his wife, his family, and everybody else. That is the twist. He came out. He comes out to meet these five virgins who were with the oil now they bring the oil he came out and look at them they should know each other say i don't know you is that not a twist is that a shocking he could send you know why they're your friends your cousin go and talk to them but why did this groom come out himself you know, he stick out the, the head, he said, you know, I, don't, I don't know you. That is very harsh, isn't it? I don't understand. Yes. So imagine your son is the, the groom, right? Yes. And he comes out to his friend. He say, no, uh, you, you cannot enter. So basically, if you're thinking of it like that, uh -huh. it's a very confusing you know, um, parable. I mean, oh like, yeah, I understand it, and it's it's oh, like okay, and then just move on to the next, you know, teaching or next parable. No, like, no, no. That so that's that's the problem. See, it, he's doing something. He's twisting our mind to think. And if you were, if you were the, um, if you were uh, the the Israelites and the Jews at that time. And you were sitting there and listening. He just keeps twisting your mind. Okay, this is, doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. Right. You know, in the middle of night, you go and nobody opens the stores. And they manage to get the oil. And you go, they work really hard. And then the bridegrooms come out. So instead of them uh, welcoming the bridegroom, the bridegrooms came out and unwelcomed them. Right. This would not happen in a normal wedding or American wedding. So anybody come in, no problem, right? You don't want to embarrass them and everything else, right? We have a different culture. So 
Yes, Olivia, you raised your finger. Well, yeah, I well the I, I guess going on what Denise just said, uh, the foolish virgins apparently found the oil, and they showed up to the uh, uh, wedding feast. So if you're going to, and you said it wasn't, but if you're going to think it was Jesus, then I thought you could, at the very last minute, you know, be able to to uh, go to the kingdom of heaven. Oh, uh, yeah. If you so repented or you, you got yourself yeah. back in shape. That's the problem with us. We keep thinking the bridegroom is Jesus. Right, right. So it's not. That's our but, problem. Yeah. That's our problem. It's not? Right. He, Jesus but, never said the bridegroom is him himself. He but, never said. Okay. We, kept, we okay. got indoctrinated into thinking the bridegroom has to be Jesus, or the king has to because, be Jesus, or the master has to be Jesus. That's the problem. Because the beginning of this starts, then the kingdom of heaven will be like yeah virgins yeah who their right lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom yeah so the kingdom is like yes. But then so it's not automatically in... when you're thinking the right. kingdom of heaven, yeah. the kingdom of heaven is, I mean, like even today's reading, today's gospel reading. Yeah. The kingdom of heaven is among us. Yes. The kingdom of heaven is Jesus. And so oh, that's your interpretation. But is that Jesus, what Jesus had in mind? So if you say the kingdom and you have to have the king and you have the courts, you have the generals, you have, you know, prime ministers and all those things. And that is literal. When you take it literally, you're going to think it that way. The logic of literal reading or you read it from the uh, parabolic or really this is a story, the parable. He's comparing. He's not saying the kingdom of God is but will be like. Right. So yeah. he is, he is um, showing us one aspect of what the kingdom of God of heaven is going to be like. So it doesn't imply, oh, we, we think we take literally, okay, the kingdom has to have a king. And then how could you have a king in a wedding? And we, oh yeah, the, the groom has to be the king. No, no, that's a wedding, the village wedding. You have no king here. You have a village, you have the house, you have two families, you have a wedding. If to read uh, according to what Jesus is in mind, people at that moment, they would not think that he is a king yet. Uh, There's no king until he died. And the only one who really pronounce or declare that Jesus is a king is Pontius Pilate. Legally hmm. speaking, on writing. Okay? In Greek, in Hebrew, in Latin. Yes? Only Pontius Pilate called him a king on the cross. But at that moment, nobody's going to think he's a king. Yet. Okay, they come to realization, okay, he could be, you know, the Messiah, the anointed one, the, you know, one who comes in the name of God. later on. But this, you know, they, they come slowly the, in, the, in developing the uh, identity of who Jesus is. But when you, you take it literally and apply it to the parable, we're going to have a kind of, we call it disparity of comparison. You stay within the context of a parable. And we, okay. it's hard for us to, um, to clean ourselves, clear ourselves of the connection, association between the bridegroom and Jesus. Okay. Because we say, yeah, the church is the bride and Jesus is the bridegroom. That is in us. But now we're talking about the parable. We're not talking about the typology of the church and Christ. That's Paul. A okay, very different uh, scenario here. So it is shocking, mind twisting for so many people to read it this way. And we are reading it. We're studying it. We have to be honest about what's going on. So when you think that Jesus is the groom and Jesus is supposed to be meek and gentle and humble of heart, he comes out and says, I don't know you. But in fact, he knows. <laughs> He's a bridegroom. They know each other. They had rehearsal. 
They know the house, the virgins, you know, the virgin know where the house is. So, so yeah, they, that's why they go to the house, the wedding, and they knock at the door. Yes, no, yes. So, yeah, Olivia. but why, why did they lock the, why did the bridegroom lock the door? That's why the question. The that's the question. That's a ten million, six million dollars question <laughs> for the the bionic <laughs> man, like six million dollar man. Yeah. yeah. In the seventies, but now like six billion dollars man now. Hmm. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. So that's the question. Do you so, know the answer? <laughs> no, I'm studying with you, so I'm studying everything with you. I'm not gonna give I, you. I want to know why. <laughs> So let's let's study the scenario, the culture, surround the context, um, surround the, 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 the my the, brain hurts. <laughs> twisted everything. I, we, I can't yes. believe. I mean, this is just like, oh my gosh! I thought I knew, and now I don't yes, know. <laughs> It's like okay. you know when your eyes are crossed like this, and you're like, oh. <laughs> so confused now oh no so like um the story of the master was the uh, the untrust a uh, wicked uh yeah. manager remember and we keep yeah. thinking the master is god or jesus no 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 who's the wicked one the, the master was a wicked one and that's why the master commanded the wicked the manager remember the untrust oh. manager and Jesus, ooh, he commanded it. What, what, what? So because when you identify the master, the king, uh, or Jesus with the groom, oh, we're in trouble. There's no way. Oh, why is Jesus so gentle and meek and humble and, and he's the bridegroom and he's so mean? Yeah. These, you know, virgins, you know, they work really hard. They toil all night to get the oil and they want right. to welcome you. And then uh, when you come out, you personally, at least you send somebody, your brother, sister, or your wife, or whoever, and come out. You yourself come out and say, I don't know. Hmm. It's really harsh. Oh my gosh, what's going so on? So tell us how what happens next. Yeah. <laughs> the end. No, 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 we need to know what happened next. I know, we've got to study this, we've got to figure this out. We're studying, really, we're studying it, we're studying the whole thing, you know. Gosh. Okay, we asked the question, why now? And so, um, is that Jesus or is not Jesus? The groom is Jesus or no? Well, it is Jesus as long as he is gentle and meek and humble and compassionate and merciful. It is not Jesus because he's so mean and he is so uh, harsh. We don't like that kind of Jesus, right? Right. But he's just. Yeah, he's right. just and so harsh and so mean. And he doesn't, con it's not considerate of them. You know, these virgins have been waiting all night. And they went out all night to find the oil. Mm -hmm. We don't like that image of Jesus at all. A mean guy. He takes it, really, he takes it personally. Didn't he? The, the, look like the Jesus who, he is the one who created this, this parable. Okay. A lot of people who are not really merciful, compassionate here, incharitable here, like, so-called the wise one. Jesus called him the wise one. And being wise means you have to reject. Being wise means you. Sometimes you have to be mean and not charitable. These five girls with that oil, ask for some and you say no. And you're wise. It's wise to say no. <laughs> so the Lord is challenging the listener to think critically. You have to think critically this way. Okay, let's take the position of the wise. How do he defines wise, the wise virgin? Okay. You consider it now. You have to put on the scale and you weigh it. Okay. 
we brought the oil with us, the torch with us, or the lamb, you call the lamb, the torch. Now we're waiting for the grooms coming all night and uh, we're running out of, uh, you know, oil, but we still have reservation. Okay. We're going to go to the house and we're going to have the torch, the lamb in the house. Okay. So either we give out the oil, we share the oil with you, and we won't be able to celebrate the wedding with the groom and the bride. And nobody would have light. It's going to ruin the whole wedding night. No? I wish, and at all, we say no to you, but we save the wedding. So you have to make a choice. Okay? Being charitable to the family, the wedding, okay, two families, or being charitable to these girls, okay, virgins who have no oil. You have to make a choice. It's not easy. But you have sometimes being wise means to say no. But, but why yes. would he say no? Why would he no, no, say no? No, no, I'm talking about the virgins. I'm not talking about oh, the virgins. Okay. Yeah. So it's okay. all about the no. See, the whole point is about no. But no is wise. Sometimes say, okay, this is going to be good for you. Okay, eat it, drink it. You know, sniff it. No. This is going to make you a lot of money. No, because they have in their mind something else, something more important. The no is a wise thing to say. Sometimes yes is a very foolish thing to say. But no is a wise thing to say. And we don't have enough. They know. No, we, we don't have enough for us and for you. So we prefer to have for ourselves and get into the wedding. We not ruin the wedding. We will not dishonor the two families. Mm -hmm. Yeah? By the fact that you have no oil, you have already dishonoring. You are already all dishonoring the families and yourself. It's right. about honor and shame, right? It's a shame. He's coming and you have to prepare. No? Yes. So wisdom is, is different from the way we understand it. Sometimes wisdom has to say no. So hmm. a child comes along and says, give me some money. Why? I'm going to go drink. No. Give me some money. Why? I'm going to go take drugs. Yes, here is the money. Go. Go ahead. Saying no is very mean. But that's charity. Yes? No? Yes. yes. Definitely. And you, you, you save the whole family, a lot of headaches, you know, that, that young man, that young woman comes home and drunk or, you know, intoxicated or he's going to ruin everybody's life. There won't be any rest of peace in the family. It's a shame. So no is wise. We don't like the word no's in the American culture. Wow. Your son comes along and say, oh, well, I'm going to get married yeah, to a woman, but I have decided to be another woman because I'm going to be a woman. Yeah. And uh, the girl who's going to get married to me decides to be a man. We'll cross dress. <laughs> and you said, No, why are you so mean? I could do anything, I could say anything, I could be anyone I like. And you if you say no, you're racist. There is something you have to say no, you have to draw the line. Mm -hmm. Huh? Oh, a lot of thinking here, critical thinking. It's not saying yes about everything. Sometimes you say yes to everything. You say no to something else. When you say no to something, okay, you're saying yes to something else. So yes. it's about wise and foolishness, isn't it? Yes. I... It's about how, what does it mean to be wise? Sometimes saying no, uh, I'm not going to eat another, you know, a third uh, of the chocolate cake. I have twice already. 
Uh, one more? <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I had two cups of coffee already, so it's gonna be very hyperactive now. You know, third, fourth. I have uh, two classes, uh, three classes of wine already. No, no is the beginning of wisdom. Yes. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord makes you say no. Because you worship the Lord above all. No, yes, yes. Yeah. Is, it, is there, a, I know about fear of the Lord is, is the beginning of wisdom, but is there actual Bible saying that says no is the very first sentence you said, Father, about no is wisdom? Well, now my interpretation is, my read is this. When you fear something, you won't, you run away from it. You hide from it. You say no. Right. No, yes. Yes. Because definitely. we fear sickness. That's why we keep ourselves away from cholesterol, eating our fat and sugar. No. Uh, we, we fear diabetes. We say no to a lot of sugar, sugary things. The fear means saying no. And we are going to say yes to something else. We're going to fight for something else. Okay. So it's the beginning of wisdom. Saying no is the beginning of wisdom. But you have to know where or when or what to say no to. Mm -hmm. So the whole parable is about, is about wise and foolishness, being wise and being foolish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Has nothing to do with praying and, and doing stations across or saying the rosary or meditation. Do we are meditating right now? Mm -hmm. We're filling our uh, flask with oil right now with a lot of oil right now because we are really studying it. This is how you uh, trill oil. Trill oil. <laughs> but, yeah, really. We trill oil by studying it. Yeah. And you see how Jesus, you know, you get, the more you read, really listen to uh, what Jesus had to say in his parable, the more you know his, his uh, personality and his uh, characteristic, right? You know more about Jesus, what kind of man he is. It's not about just the parable, what he says, but what he is, how he is. Mm -hmm. And we tend to have a kind of a very superficial understanding of the man Jesus. When you read, his stories, you're reading him. What is going on in his mind, his heart, and his his feeling and his vision of uh, of us. We get to be inside his himself, really, literally. We get to be inside his mind, his psyche. There are a lot of things that he say no. And he shares with us his psyche. And by saying no like that, he's helping us to say no as well. You move to another level, this mystical level right now. Yeah. So, two no's. One no, no, we won't share. Okay. And then the ten virgins, uh, five virgins, uh, no oil virgins, Come along to the house and knock at the door. Let us in, let us in. And the groom himself came out. Strange. That is um that is uh, a way to solve problem, the best way to solve problem. When you have a problem, you have to confront it directly. You don't abdicate your responsibility or you don't just uh, refer it, right? transfer it to another person to solve your own problem. These five virgins, they were already problematic. Now, the groom has to be the head of the household now. He has to take care of the problem. Mm. Himself. The best way to solve a problem is to face it head on. And you take responsibility for saying no. You yourself take on the problem yourself. And the word no 
means this. This is Jesus saying, not my, not mine, okay? I do not know you. No means I don't know you. Wait, Father, you just said Jesus said. Yeah, that's what he so said. Jesus, Amen, I said to you, I do not know you. you. Yeah, but Jesus. now it's Jesus, whereas before it was the bridegroom. Yes, the bridegroom said so. But Jesus said so. so Is this story? Jesus, it was Jesus yes. all this time then. No, right? no. So no? Th th that's the question. Is it Jesus? No, right? So Jesus, this is his words. The bridegrooms could be words. anybody. Right. But the word is Jesus saying it. Nobody invented these words. He was the one who said, I do not know you. Okay, that's in the parable. No, it's, it, it says, but he said in reply. So yeah, is the, Lord, the bridegroom Lord... said in reply, but who invented the story? Jesus invented the story. Oh, he put okay, his so word he in the mouth of the, the character, the bridegroom, right? The okay. groom. Right. So okay. it is Jesus who used that word, his words, yeah. in the parable. Twist the tongue. So yeah. he's telling about the, the groom, and the groom came out on his own without the bride by himself, confronting these five women or girls or virgins. And the groom said, I do not know you. But now, you know, why I say Jesus said so. Who like to say, amen, amen. <laughs> Jesus said, amen, I say to you. <laughs> that, is that not the, the way Jesus like to say before? Right. He, he says something really important. Amen, right. I say to you. You know, Moses, is, the Lord said that. And I say to you. Okay. Yeah. Now, okay. this is, it is. You know, everybody, okay, you like to say that. That's you now. Some hints. The groom is that Jesus, not the Jesus we know. The groom is not the one, oh, the mean one to say, the one to say, no, oh, get away, get out of here, get away from here. I don't know you. Amen, I say to you. Okay, now, this immediately alludes to, or you could connect this to chapter 7 of um, this uh, of uh, Matthew. Okay, Let's take a look at chapter 7 verse 21. Okay. I'm going to read to you. Okay, who has it? Denise, you have it? Yeah. 21. Let's read it, Denise. Read okay. Fast. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, but... stop right there. Okay. To whom? Everyone is addressing to whom? Everyone says to whom? Let's read it again. To me. Not everyone me who is me. To me. Me who is me. To whom? Jesus. Me is whom? Okay. So now is literal. Yes. Okay, Jesus is saying that not everyone who addresses me or calling me, Lord, Lord, and continue on, please. Okay, but only the one. No, so go, go ahead to, to go back to 21 so we see here the whole thing. Okay. okay, not everyone who says to me. To Jesus, okay, me, Jesus, okay. Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Only the one who does the will of my father in heaven. Okay. You want to go on to 22? Go ahead, yeah. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Okay. Did we not drive out demons in your name? Okay. Did we not do mighty deeds in your name? Okay. And then 23 says, then I will declare to them solemnly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Okay, let's wow. stop there. Doesn't sound familiar or similar to the parable? Yes, yes, yes. The virgins came along and say, Lord, no, they say, no, open, open. No. I do not know. No. 
Okay, so let's see. Let's see what they say. Lord, Lord, open the door for us. Oh, Lord, Lord, we enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is Matthew in the same, same cultural, you know, uh, context. Same Matthew in the mind of Matthew. You understand? He knows the law. He knows the Jewish law. Okay. Judaic law. And he knows the wedding. And this is Jesus speaking to his disciples in person, literally, no longer in parable. Chapter 7, you know, verse 21 to 23. That means those who listen to him you know, from uh, chapter, uh, chapter 7 to chapter 17, that means people have, they are used to listening to amen, amen, I say to you. And they are used to this story of Lord, Lord already. And among those who say, Lord, Lord, and he listed, these are literal people, real people, those who use his name, okay, to prophesize, those who use his name to drive out demons, and those who use his name to perform mighty deeds. These include the disciples, the apostles, include, including Judas Iscariot who uses his name to prophesy, to drive out demons, and to do miracles. Um, and then Jesus saying to them directly, to his disciples, he said, Lord, yeah. Lord, you use my name, you know my name, but no, you will not enter into. Solemnly, I declare, I never knew you. You evildoers. What kind of Jesus do you want to believe now? You want to follow now? This is not easy to hear. Yeah. But it's so different kind of Jesus now. So we, we have a very nice kind of hippie kind of Jesus. And long hair and gentle. And, but this is so severe. Well, amen, I say to you, I do not know you. But now you go back to Jesus. This is why he used the parable. He knows many people abused his name, misused his name, took advantage of his name. To use his name to make money, to make a name for themselves, to perform miracles, drive them demons and all those things. He knows their heart. He tells this story, this parable as a warning, as a teaching tool, so we could reflect on it. What does it mean to be wise? What does it mean to be foolish? You have oil? You have no oil. What do you honor? What do you love? So you go to the wedding for yourself, are you going to wedding for the groom, the family? So it, it is about attentiveness once again. So you have 10 virgins, right? You have to really do a kind of uh, evaluation and evaluation on them. The, the five wise one, they were thinking about the, the wedding, the bridegrooms and their friends or family, the bride. That's why they came prepared. But the other ones, they came, they brought, okay, I got invited and the wedding, I just go and crash the party. They really, they were crashing the party, the wedding crasher. No? Yes? Would you invite somebody to come to your own, you know, wedding and ask them to crash your wedding? No. And the groom knows, you know, these women, oh, no. Even you have the oil. After you have the oil, what are you going to use the oil for? The oil is for welcoming, you know, the walk, the procession from there to Hi. the wedding. Now it's useless. There's no use for it anymore. And then when you come in for what? This is a lesson for these people. Okay. The question is, well, he say he gives a command, oh, stay awake, right? But for what purpose? For what purpose? Is the groom 
is the groom, the purpose. Okay, and the wedding, the bride, the groom, the wedding, the family is the purpose for you. So now let's go back to reality. There's layers and layers of reading for this uh, parable. Okay, so we begin. We beginning. Uh, we begin with this. As a human being, you were born. You know you have children, and the first thing they are aware. The awareness, you know, the first thing coming into the, into their awareness is that there's only the present. A child has no past. She, he doesn't know the past. Doesn't have a future. Only now. I want it now. I want milk now. I want diapers now. I want, you know, you know hugs, embrace now. Otherwise, I'm going to cry. Yeah? Development. Now, me, present. Well, the next step is that the child knows about me. I, because everybody say, talk to me, okay. You, you, you're so cute and all those things. And the child starts growing and there's now the present and then it's me. That's the second step. First, just the present, the second step, and then the child becomes aware, only human being aware of uh, himself or herself, me and present. Yeah? And it seems that uh, there's a present in me and everybody revolves around me and whatever I say, just cry, everybody's going to provide for me. Second step, right? And it's going to grow a little bit if we don't teach the child. Okay, The child's going to grow up and grow old and be childish, old mm -hmm. men and women. Just me and present. There's no future. Because I never thought about the future. Whatever I want has to be now. Instant gratification. For me now. And everybody has to save me. Otherwise, I'm a victim. You are the abuser. You are the, uh, you know, the racist, whatever. Me and my present. No future. But then you grow up a little bit. You get to another step. Okay, I have to think about my future. I have to get a job and be independent. So I go to school. Okay. And I have to sacrifice the present. I have to sacrifice the me to get the future I want. So that person, the young person, will think about the future. There's a sacrifice right there. Mm -hmm. I sacrifice the present to me for the future me. Yes? Yes. Yes. But then, well, along the way, oh, I found out that uh, I don't have only the future me and my future, but I do have the past. Somebody has, has been helping me. Mm. I own Okay. I owe you know, my life, whatever I have, the blessings, to these people. Everything is a blessing for me, a privilege for me. Okay, So the expansion of not just the present, but you have a history, a past will help you. And the future, even when you reach your future self and your future because of somebody. And so you realize, okay, somebody else, it's like me. They need they need their future, they need their present, they need to be themselves. So I would yield, I would sacrifice my present, even my future and myself for another person. Not because I love them, because they need it. Some people would say, okay, uh, I could graduate later, uh, you go work and I pay for it. Some parents would do that. I will not get the education as long as all the children get the education. I sacrifice my future, my present, and myself just for you to get your future. Mm. No? Yes, so there's yes. a kind of a, a process of development here into maturity. Mm. So you reach your future because you do have the future and you achieve your future and you become the future self and the future self becomes the present self and then you do have the past because this is these are my achievements all the experience all the hardship all the sacrifice i have made that's my history that's my past 
What you gonna do in the present? You no longer live for yourself. You think about the family. You think about the groom. You think about the bride. You think about the wedding. Mm -hmm. Is that me? I come and join and just bought the, the, the church without oil because the oil is not just for me. I'm not living for myself at the moment, at the present, in the present. I'm using this, I sacrifice myself a little bit, get the oil, so this is for the groom and everybody else. Okay? So the staying awake is the question, the command to stay awake is a question, is this another question that we have to ask? For what? For whom? What purpose to stay awake? Are we stay awake to watch, um, I call it, after Christmas, uh, shopping, yeah, after the day of Christmas, there's uh, people wait for Boxing Day. Stay awake for that. In England. Yeah, right? it's called Boxing, Boxing Day. Yeah. In Canada. In yeah, Canada. Yeah. Or you have, you know, we've been bad many things, just waiting for something you want. But what are we staying awake for? What For what purpose? Yeah, you say, stay awake. Yeah, I, I hear the command and I have to obey it. But what for? For whom? For what? For me? For you? For whom? And because we have the why, so we could endure giving up or sacrificing the present. We know the Explain. future is going because Explain we know again. the why, because we do have the why. We know the why. We are, we have the strengths, we have the reason, the cause to endure and yield or sacrifice of giving up our present and ourselves. That's maturity. Okay. Father, yes. is, is, that, Go ahead. is that doing God's will? Is, is that what, what you're... I'm talking humanly. I'm not talking about God's will yet. Okay. You're reading into something. We're just being human. Let's be human. Because I know the why in principle. Mm -hmm. For whom I'm doing this. For what I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I know the why. Now I have the strength to endure the giving up, the sacrificing of my present, of myself. Because I'm aiming the thing I want in the future. That's why I stay awake. I'm waiting for something, I'm expecting someone. And what is that one? What is that thing? Is it God? Or is it my achievement, success? Or what is it? I get a position in life, money, fame, whatever. But it's open-ended. What is it that you are staying awake for? Jesus says, stay awake, right? And in the context of this parable, is staying awake for the groom. He's coming. It's coming like lightning. You don't know when, you don't know when. But you have to ask the question, why should I stay awake? For whom do I stay awake? And the one you're staying awake for, for whom you stay awake, is the one you really love or you adore or you worship. People sacrifice for what they adore, what they worship, what they serve. Mm -hmm. So you have to ask the question, these virgins without oil, who are they serving? Themselves? Or who else? And why did they knock at the door? They're late already. They get going there for people to serve them? Yeah? Hard work. But the ultimate test is that you reach the end you could run you know you do a lot of practice and rehearsal and exercise all year long okay 
but the most important thing is this you reach the, the final destination you reach it but you don't reach it what's the point of exercising and, and, and sacrificing and doing all those kind of work mm -hmm. they, they did not reach the end so they were aware and they were awakened to something else but not to the end the end the final end is not the wedding with the groom they were supposed to be waiting expecting the groom for the groom okay so thank you everybody ah uh, what was that thank you everybody <laughs> Oh. No, 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 no. You can't get away with that. <laughs> uh. We end with a question. No, thank you. I say thank you. We end with a thank you. Okay. So the, the, the virgins, I mean, so, so we, not the virgin, I'm sorry, to, to have, uh, apply it to us, we work for the future because we love God and we want to be with him. And we also work to have our family and our loved ones likewise um, be prepared, have their oil in their laps ready. Is, is that a one possible conclusion? It's up to you. It's in your hand right now. Gotcha. But I see the one thing I could see is this are you filled up with oil? Yes. <laughs> I don't know. So <laughs> you, you you move from you know being uh, the foolish virgins into a uh, very wise virgin. The the <laughs> definition of foolish virgins are virgins without oil, and uh, the wise one are the virgins with oil. And the uh, wise ones are the ones who are able to say and have no problem saying no. Mm -hmm. Emphatically. And because you know yourself, I don't have enough for myself and for you and for the whole wedding. Um, you know, so we know our limit. That's wisdom. It's not we have a lot of knowledge. We have a lot of resources. We don't. We know our limit. That's wisdom. That's very wise. So before you were empty, now you're filled with a lot of confusion. So. <laughs> okay, as long thank as you, we're everybody. On the right path. Thank okay, you. we're on the right path. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank so, you very much. Let's pray. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As, as it was in the beginning, is now, is now and, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you all. And with, and with your spirit, Father. The Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thank God you bless Father. you all. Thank you.